Thank you. And let me add my welcome and thank you for coming on behalf of the uh, State University of New York at Potsdam, whose president, Kristen Esterberg, would love to have been here, but I'm happy to welcome you on her behalf and on behalf of the Crane School of Music. We're very happy to, uh, along with NAM, celebrate the memory of, of Sandy Feldstein, who was a graduate of the Crane School of Music, a member of the faculty. And in the decade or so since his passing, we've uh, been happy to have sessions like this at NAM where uh, students have been able to hear from folks in the music business about careers, options, preparation, and all kinds of questions that they have, which seems a perfect way to honor Sandy's memory. So thank you for coming, and it's my honor to introduce our friend Joe Lamont, the CEO of NAM and recipient of an honorary degree from the State University of New York, who will host the session. Joe, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Dean. Welcome, everybody. It's Saturday afternoon at the NAM show. How many of you are here for the session versus how many of you are here just because it was a seat? <laughs> I mean, think about the third day of the show. I imagine each and every one of you have just covered at least 15 miles a day. Is that about right, you think? Yeah. Well, welcome. Um, we've got a big mix here. I don't know if some of the college kids can come over here somehow. We can move them in a little bit. Uh, we've got a bunch of scholarship winners at NAM, and we've got all our special guests here, that's you. And I just, first of all, I always want to start by just saying thank you. Thanks for everything you do to make this a more musical world. Everything you do every day. It's amazing, it's got impact, and we're so blessed to have you in our lives and have you part of the NAM family. By the way, did you all know you're part of the NAM family? And no one ever leaves the NAM family, right? No one ever leaves. <laughs> so today, I've got a pretty simple end zone. We've got some great guests. We're gonna talk about careers. We're gonna talk about paths that you may pick up an idea or two to help you figure out where your trajectory is going to be. I think the one thing to remember is there is no one trajectory. This is not molecular or biological genetic scientist stuff. This is not take this class, go to that school, get into this master's, get into this PhD, and get a job at Scripps. This is not this at all. This is the music business. And so many of you will make up your own path, sometimes a path that never even existed before. And that's the most exciting part about this industry to me. You're going to meet people today who actually created their own paths in the business, and you'll find out how they got there. So we're going to get right to it. I'm going to bring them up one at a time, and then we're going to have a joint conversation at the end. So I don't know how many of you were at the breakfast session on Thursday. God, Laura, what day did you play? I'm so lost. Yesterday. That was so yesterday. Laura Escudé played yesterday at the opening of the breakfast session. So I'd just like to start by bringing Laura up. Laura Escudé, please, come on up. You're going to take this seat right here. Awesome. And again, there's this, a great bunch of people here who are trying to learn a little bit about your story and your path and how you were able to crack this code in a way, right? So I think I'd like to start with your first NAMM show and what it was like for you to come and look at this whole thing, what, the 10, 10 years ago? 15 years ago. Fif well, yeah, 15. Okay. Yeah. 2005, I just moved to LA and I thought I wanted to be a classical violinist. <laughs> Somehow ended up where I am. That's another story, another long story. Uh, but... I came to my first NAMM show uh, working for a company called M Audio, and I had no idea the magnitude of something like NAMM. And I was exposed and introduced to all these incredible companies and the culture here and all the people. Mm. And the next year, I was demoing at the company. And then I kept demoing and kept getting asked to come back and do presentations and performances and be on panels like this. And it's been quite the journey. Yeah. How did you make that first leap? Did you just walk around and introduce yourself? Or how did this... I know it's a weird question, but they were asking me with the scholarship winners, where's the first move? How do you start? It's all about the connections, right? It's, you know, I mean, of course there's amazing gear here, right? No one can uh, say that there's not, but it's about the connections that you're making, the hands that you're shaking, and the way that you're, you're speaking and, and talking to people. And I just believe in making connections and uh, fostering those connections, and that's what so I've done. over the yeah. years, things developed, 
and it got a little, you felt more familiar, more comfortable, you knew more people? Yes, definitely. I know the NAM show, like the back of my hand, except for they just opened up these other wings, and so now it's like, what is this NAM show? It's gotten bigger. <laughs> I still have dreams of places I haven't seen yet at the NAM show. <laughs> it's like actually nightmares. What? We've got this room too? Um, but yeah, so walk me through some of the journey of the, te- of the jobs you had or roles you played, maybe it's a better way to put it, here at the show. Yeah, so, um, well, first working at a company like M Audio, uh, incredible company, I was doing Pro Tools demos. Then uh, they started distributing this little known software company called Ableton. And I started working at Ableton and did demos for Ableton. And, and I actually got laid off from the company in uh, 2008 with a restructuring. And it was such a hard time for me, but I just took that and I decided, you know what, I'm gonna make my own path now and I'm gonna build my own company. And I, that's what I did. I started my own company and that was in 2008. And I've got, still got great relationships with the company and became the first certified trainer at Ableton and work with a bunch of other companies. But yeah, it just, I, I turned something that was really hard for me into something that was very positive for me. Yeah, I yeah. think that's one of the things, unfortunately, you have to learn the hard way. That quite often when something really bad happens and it seems like the end of the world and it's terrible, there's something on the other side. There, there always is. It's something incredible. And you just have to keep that positive frame of mind. Yeah. yeah. And every time I've seen it, it's actually something better on the other side. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to fast forward because we're going to talk a little bit more as a group. But what are you doing now? <laughs> I'd love to hear a little <laughs> well, So uh, I'm an artist and entrepreneur. Um, I performed at the breakfast yesterday, which was incredible. Um, I've also been performing at the Eventide stage uh, for this NAM. Um, I do a lot of performances with music and technology and playing violin. And I also have a company called Electronic Creatives and we do live show programming for artists. So I toured for a number of years with various artists on the road as their playback engineer, someone who plays back the music for the shows, which sounds very simple, but it's actually very complicated. Until, yeah, until it's simple until it's not perfectly synced. Yeah, absolutely. And I toured for seven years with Kanye West and worked with Cirque du Soleil and got all these jobs. Just one thing led to another and formed a company from that and started training people to do what I do as a playback engineer. That one thing led to another. Sounds so simple, but it's really not, huh? Right. Well, when you're in it, you don't see the next step, but then you start to see the next steps as they come, you know, as you tune in a little bit more, I think. You start to envision what your next step's going to be. Something from the road. Did you like touring? I loved it. I mean, I love touring. Um, I've, I, I jokingly say I'm semi-retired from touring because I don't actually do it that much now. I still work on um, some television shows and things like that. But um, I did really enjoy touring for a time. It can be challenging for the, for the home life and for the body and all that kind of stuff. But I did really enjoy it. I think what we're hearing here is that there's, like so many of us, there's no one thing that you do. There's multiple things that you do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, <laughs> I couldn't rein it in if I tried. I just have so many different interests and things. Yeah. And I love to mentor and, and, and support the, the younger generation coming up as well through my company and through my educational programs that I have. And so I'm really passionate about giving back and to let people know that there is a path other than the one that they think that they might be on right now. Because yeah. I had no idea that I would end up being where I am now from being a classical violinist. Yeah. You know? So you moved your end zone from one to the other to the other. I just, it just kept moving in it and it's still moving. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want it to be ever really stationary, right? Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. That, I mean, after doing something for a while, I started to get to itchy. You know, you got to get to the next thing. And it's all within the realm of music, but it's how can I push myself a little bit farther and... and and do a little bit more with what I already have. I think one of the takeaways from this is that the fact this industry is broad enough and diverse enough that all those things are possible, that you can follow something that you found you happen to be good at. Absolutely, and it's knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at, because I used to try to do everything, right? And some of us have that, uh, we don't want to ask for help, right? Yeah. And then when I started asking for help and I started expanding my company, expanding the people that were working with me, that's when really things started to open up a little bit more for me because I realized, okay, this is my zone of genius. This is what I'm good at. Um, I'm good at the music. I'm good at the connections. Things I'm not as good at, uh, structure and process. I'm a creative, right? So finding people that 
can fill in the blanks and fill in the gaps there for me yeah. became important. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move down one. Laura, if okay. you can go there. Thank you. I know, this is like I'm speed dating here. <laughs> um, Tim Spicer, great friend of ours, one of the, in my opinion, one of the best music stores in the country. And if I lived in his town, I would be there all the time. Tim, come on up. <laughs> okay, so grab that mic and pass one down or however you want to do that. And then we're, we're learning to share as we learned on Sesame Street, sharing. Okay, Tim, Tim and I first met when he, I think, at one of the shows probably, but also in Washington lobbying for music education. And it just never dawned on me that he was actually the owner and founder of his music store until I finally really paid attention for a second. How did you start a music store? Uh, yes, yeah, so I graduated from college in 2012 with a degree in special ed. And um, it, long story short, didn't feel led after, after graduation to be in a classroom, but um, really wanted to be involved with music and the music industry. I love music and I've loved it all my life and I love working with people. And um, so it just kind of came about as an opportunity to be focused with serving people and working with people all day, every day, and then being involved in music. So it just... Super simple. Like yeah. Everyone could do it. <laughs> but then you said, I'm going to open a music store. How did, how did you start? What was the impetus? Sure. So met with my family and said, I've got this crazy idea. I want to open a, a store. And they were like, are you sure? Because you have a teaching certificate and you, we spent all this money in college and there's all, you know. And um, so it was, um, it was like, a, it was kind of a whirlwind. It was like a just dive head first over the cliff and uh, swim as hard as you can. <laughs> so I've been kind of learning as I go with this. Who helped you along the way? So mentorship is incredible. And uh, NAMYP has a pretty cool mentorship program. Um, but um, I've, I came to my first NAM show. I heard about NAM. And I came to my very first NAM show. I walked in the door and I met a, a dear friend now, Nick Averwater and the Averwater family. Um, and he invited me to NAM Young Professionals, NAMYP. And I went to that event and just started to meet people and socialize. And uh, I thought of it. I came with a mindset of um, this is work and this is, you know, I mean, this is obviously NAM is an incredible experience and so, you know, it's such a sensory overload. Um, but if you come with the, the focus that this is work and I'm coming to make other lives better and to hopefully make connections that can make, you know, our lives better at, this, at our store and our business, then um, that's kind of been my driving force. I got the sense you found it very welcoming when you arrived. Yes, NAM is an incredibly welcoming environment, and there's, I mean, there's competition going on, but people are reaching across the aisle and are helping each other, and there's that, that mentality that as the waters rise, we all rise, so it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. I think having the friendships probably helped you along the way when you hit some tough times, or the idea of what probably wasn't all linearly perfect with the store growing up. N no, far from it. <laughs> Um, yes, I've relied heavily on friendships and on um, just always seeking advice and um, never, you know, never getting too far away from being humble enough to know that you don't know at all or even close. And there's people who are um, who have been through life and have learned the ups and downs. And um, and so, uh, you know, trying to pinpoint weaknesses and then turn those into strengths or divvy those off to other people's strengths. So. Say a few words about being an entrepreneur. Um, Wow, yeah. Um, By the way, I gave them questions, and I've totally thrown them out the window. So that's if you see them pause, it's because they didn't hear any of these questions before. So welcome to my world. No, I love it. <laughs> so I think being an entrepreneur is, um, is about always striving to get better and to make whatever you're a part of better. So not only better individually, but better as a team, better as a business, better in our community, and um, and it's an outreach thing. And it's so my goal is personally just to never stop learning, to never stop getting involved. But um, but I think that's kind of that's the heart of the entrepreneur spirit is to never stop improving or looking for improvements with whatever you're involved in. Are you a good boss? Um, am I a good boss? <laughs> um, Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> eh, um, I, I, it's, it's challenging. I think the biggest thing that I've learned is that management is not always leadership. Leadership is not always management. Those two don't, don't go hand in hand. Leadership is more of an, an inspiring and an encouraging and, um, and giving tasks away and training and, and knowing that um, you know, a lot of heads are better than one head. And 
Um, so it's, it's a challenge. I haven't quite hit the nail on the head uh, yet, and I struggle every day with it. But I think as long as I have a, an incredible team and I keep pushing them and giving them opportunities, they're going to do way better than I could ever do. You know, we talked a lot about Crossroads, right? The whole theme this seems to be this year is Crossroads. You hit a Crossroads coming out of school. You made a choice. You went a direction. Any regrets? Uh, zero regret. Well, I do have a regret. Uh -oh. I would have loved to have uh, special ed is a, is a big heart and a big passion of mine, but like a couple of business classes or like an accounting financial management 101 in college, that would have been great. Um, but, uh, but no, no regrets as far as the business or the industry. And I, I think that speaks wonders that you don't have to know at this age in life what your next step is or where you're going to end up when you're, you know, um, into the heart of your career. Uh, you're just continuously putting a foot forward, asking for, for advice and um, continue trying to make a difference. Cool. Okay, everyone move down one. Leave a microphone. Next up, this is one of the kind of people you meet, you just go, man, she's going places and I just want to be a part of it. I'd like to bring up Farah Allen from the labs. <laughs> Farah, come on up. I'm so glad we're here. <laughs> Who would have thought? We met in Nashville last summer when they were doing a session in Tech Tracks. And the cool part about what Farah does is she was telling me about it and after about five minutes I just realized I had no idea what she does. So what do you do? <laughs> I help creatives better manage their business processes. Let's see if you can do better than I did, because I'm like, is that a drum? Like, what, what do you yeah. mean here? So, yeah. what do you so, do? So, I mean, the creative process is, is what it is. It's, it's fun. It's intriguing. You're, you're putting ideas together with other people. You're collaborating. What you're not doing is worrying about your intellectual property, um, ownership at times. You're not worrying about agreements or documents in that, that time period. And that's pretty much where it all starts. IP starts at the beginning. So my platform replaces um, your file sharing, your texting, your email, and yet you do all that stuff in our plat in the labs. And we protect you and we automate those business processes for you. So you saw a challenge that artists were having yep. in protecting their intellectual property or you know, following it through its lifespan yes. technologically, and you found a way to use technology to create a better way. A better way, a way that you don't notice that you're actually doing business. <laughs> yeah. So what? So was it a lot of programming? Is how did you actually get it started? Did you have venture capital? How did it start? It really, it started with the the creative community telling me what their problem was and why it's a problem. Why you know really getting in the head of different types of creatives, and then after that, it really was you know making sure I we come up with a solution that best fits them. We developed a prototype with our own money, and once we got around 5,000 people um, on the prototype and using it every day, we got venture capital funding. So that's where we are. <laughs> that right off the bat, that had that many people who saw the benefit of it and got signed up. I mean, how, what was that like? Yes, I mean it was amazing. I mean, it's an issue that, for the beginning of time, you know, folks. The, the business is so important, and as this world changes, being an entrepreneur and a creative is extremely important. So, yeah, people really resonated with the fact that, you know, all they have to do is what they're doing today, and the stuff that they need um, in order to have a career is automatically done for them in some way. Why did you start it? Did you have another path before and say, look, I want to be an entrepreneur? What was the... Yeah. What was the crossroads you faced when you started this? I've been an entrepreneur since elementary school. I, I sold candy because I found there was a need. People were hungry at 10 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> and then even in high school, I sold cut code knives. I don't know who knows that. But I you know, saw people wanted to cut pennies with scissors. So I, you know, that didn't last very long. But I always, <laughs> always had this entrepreneurial spirit and um, really... You know, I, I played instruments, you know, the early years of my life, I played saxophone, and then I went to architecture school and uh, was a creative in that field. And then I came into technology and started developing software. And then I came back to music because I married someone in the music industry. <laughs> and that community alone, you know, just seeing the heartache people went through with, um, you know, copyright infringements or just not the, the lack of knowledge and how, knowing how to protect your work and them completely saying, I'm done with this career, I'm doing something else, because they just didn't have the right tools. And technology 
it's just not, it wasn't created <laughs> for the creative process generally. So that's how I got back in there, saw a big need. I knew that my spirit um, just really drove me there to begin with, and that's where I am today. But the music part was what drew you, because this application could be in a lot of different fields, I'm guessing, right? Correct, correct. I mean, there's people drawing us in the film industry, even academic um, research, and there, there, are, there are problems with collaboration and not knowing who's doing what and copywriting. I mean, there's tons of people, but really, what when I think about certain fields, I don't want to do this. <laughs> my, my love and passion is with the music and music creators. I feel that that's um, people kind of run away and try to go into another industry maybe because of some, some other reason, but we need this for us and we need to be able to have a career and make it easier. So yeah. if I think I got this right, I'm hearing it for the second time because Nashville didn't work last year, but the idea that a songwriter or several can collaborate uses this platform, either uploads or writes on that platform, so Correct. far so good. Mm -hmm. While they're doing it, everything is locked in as far as percentages, who owns what, who did what, and it's recorded. This is where you got me with the word blockchain, it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Something like, the idea that it's recorded in a ledger that is now protected forever, yeah. and the rights are now established. Stop. You don't have to hire an attorney or trying to do all this other stuff. Nope. An artist can now know that their creations their content is protected in the way that they've established. Mm -hmm. They've agreed on already. So the other party can't come back and say, no, no, you said 49% was me. And fit. No, no, it's right here. It's there established and locked in forever. And perfect, perfect. And as far as, yeah, he's got it. Got it. it only took twice. You know? <laughs> Thank you. But that is a huge need, I think, as yeah. we, content is being created more than ever, right? I think there's more songs being written. All this equipment here is helping people mm -hmm. be able to be more creative. Yeah. And there's millions of songwriters that aspire to it, but they want to be able to know that this is protected. Exactly. Awesome. Okay, move down, everybody. Right. We're going to do one more, and then we'll do the round robin. All right. <laughs> Pauline and I have been working together for a long time. I'd like to bring up Pauline Francis from Fender Guitars. Come on, Pauline. <laughs> Welcome back. Talk about charting your own path. I mean, you know, Fender is a very traditional, was a very traditional company, right? You think about Leo Fender building, you know, these beautiful instruments that have become iconic shapes around the world, but it's also a very modern company now. How did you find your place in Fender? I love this question, Joe, because I'd like to let you all know that I started off as an intern. Started off as an intern, and I was the first ever intern at Fender's uh, marketing communications department, and I applied just like everybody else. I didn't know anybody, so... Uh, one thing led to another, and now, uh, after the internship, I got a permanent position in the marketing communications department. Yes. Have you met anyone there, or been to the show, or how, did, how was the first connection that you made? So I actually started, I, can I just mention that I, it dawned on me that this is my 10th anniversary coming to NAMM, <laughs> so what a better uh, way to spend my anniversary We're than beside 10 years, NAMM CEO. Yeah. Think about where you can be 10 years from now, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I actually got the President's Innovation Award, the scholarship. So I, I came here just like all of you did. And then I made connections. I walked up to people. I literally told um, Dave Smoliver from the National Guitar Workshop, who was my first internship, I said, I am going to work for you one day. And I did. Okay, who asked me the question earlier about <laughs> how do you start? I thought, and I just said, I, you know, I really didn't have a good answer other than getting out there and doing what you're doing. And it just sounds like, ah, oh, you're just kind of really not giving me an answer, but it is an answer. It's <laughs> that how is, you do you it. You create opportunities for yourself, you walk up, you, you make connections. And then Dave introduced me to Jason Shadrick, great friend of mine who now works for Premier Guitar. Jason um, knew the PR manager at Fender and I learned of the opportunity, so I applied along with 300 other applicants. Yeah. So how did your job develop from when you first got there? Because you charted a path that Fender didn't have a big digital strategy then, or, or it wasn't at the time, right? What was the question? Well, how did you de develop your path at My Fender? My path, then? okay. So I started off as an intern, then that turned into a full-time position in marketing, and at the time, I was doing PR and social media for all of the brands under FMIC. So Takamini, all of those, right? 
Um, after that, I uh, was offered an opportunity, and I was working for Acoustic Guitar Magazine, writing as a contributor, writing for Guitar World, and that really taught me opportunities um, that helped me develop my journalism skills, right? So I learned a little bit of PR, and I learned a little bit about journalism. Fender called me back, and uh, now I'm doing employee communications. Yes. I don't know how you put those things. Where did you go to school? What was your major? I majored in journalism with emphasis in public relations. Ah. But before that, I was majoring in music education. And I'm very glad you brought up this point. Because does anybody want to take a guess at how many years it took me to graduate from college? Uh, should I call you? Can I get a lifeline and call your parents? <laughs> yes. It took me eight years. And that is because I wanted to make sure that I knew that I was in love with what I was majoring in. But the beautiful thing is that I was able to combine those two things, music education with PR, and I love it. So one of the questions I would usually kind of ask the group, although this is probably the most diverse group I've ever had, that you didn't formally come up to a mu music business program. And so my usual question would be, what do you wish you'd have learned in one of those business classes that you see now is applicable in your life? But I would more say many of you shifted education and shifted your plans. But I'll start with Laura. Anything in your education that you wished would have covered real life? Anything that jumps out that said, boy, I wish they would have only taught me that? Probably how to manage our limiting beliefs and our thoughts about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely been key for me in the past couple of years, just shifting my perspective. And it's opened up a lot for me, yeah. Now, Tim, you had a different major, but you mentioned you'd wish you had some more financial training. And yes, <laughs> I think really, probably regardless of what job you have at any business or whether you're into songwriting or producing, um, just kind of the, the knowledge and the management of that cash flow, whether it's personal or whether it's business, is uh, pretty valuable. Yeah. Right, what about you? Anything in your back Ron, that you think you wish you would have covered? <laughs> yeah, I think networking. You know, relationships are extremely important as you move up the ladder and just the nuance and science behind that would have been really good. They don't teach networking, do they? No, they don't. I mean, does anyone, anyone take a networking class? I mean, any of you educators, do you think they should offer one or can they offer one? I don't know what it would be like. I guess you just show up at Starbucks and pass cards around. But I, I think that would be a really important thing to learn. Though. So can I give you in on a little secret about yeah. the networking? So I joined all of the groups on campus, things that had nothing to do with my major. Yeah. And that's where I developed my networking skills. And I also learned what I didn't want to do, things like the Earth Science Club. Not for me. You joined the Earth Science I, Club? I joined the I should Earth have asked Science fun Club. fact first, but I guess that's a fun fact. Yes. <laughs> so as far as what I didn't learn in school, I think that I learned along the way, but nobody taught me, was that failure is a key part of your growth because it teaches you character building. And you're going to need that. It doesn't always go smooth. Oh, no. The, would anyone really want it to go? I guess we think we want it to go smoothly and never have a problem, but looking back on my career... Those were the only times any good stuff really happened was when I was absolutely at the bottom. Yep. And maybe because I was dissatisfied or whatever happened, but it pushed me to do something else. Any of you have that experience when you were just like, God, where do I go next? You know? Absolutely. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I got laid off from my dream job. So I had to create my own path. At the time, I didn't know what that was, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me because I just created my own world and my brand. Tim, anything ever really go south? And re no, not really. But <laughs> no, I mean there has been. I've I've um, made some fantastic hires um, of new employees, and um, some many of those you know college age students. And I've mad made some hires that I thought were incredible at the time, but turned out not to be so great. Um, and so really, kind of, fi and I don't know if this question's coming, but really finalizing, you know, the the that the heart and the passion matters just as I, I would even maybe say more than the than the skill or the knowledge so um yeah to kind of trying to decide there's navigate. things you can teach and there's things you possess already right i think 100%. um i would like that we talk a lot about mentorships right we do and i think that's really important we have a formal mentoring program with yp um the swim is starting a mentoring program with young women in music but the idea that mentoring can be a lot of different things if anyone in your life that is worth, you think, remembering that really influenced you that you'd like to share here? 
someone that really helped you or really helped shape you in a way that a mentor might, even formal or informal? Who was someone that you really were um, influenced by? So I used to be a technology consultant and um, work for the government and <laughs> the CTO of the, you know, of the, it was the Secretary of State office. He just had a way of thinking that I just admired so much. It was outside, it was way outside the box, but it also just really made me think differently about how I'm thinking about, you know, solving problems. There was never a problem he didn't navigate through. And I just thought that was a terrific skill. I didn't even know people had that, that skill set at that time. So, I, you know, Merritt Beaver, wherever you are, thank you. <laughs> That's cool. How about you, Pauline? Is mom a permissible answer? She's right there. She's in the audience. Then that's a yes, good start. Yes, my family has been <laughs> instrumental. Um, but I would say Jason Shadrick, whom I mentioned earlier, he showed me the ropes. He told me what NAM was. I didn't know uh, at the time. And um, I want to say thank you to Jason if he's out there. Yes. Laura, who was important to you that you felt? Can I also say my mom? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, I've had a lot of different mentors, but short spurts, but my mom was the one that originally taught me about limiting beliefs and how to overcome them, and I didn't listen to her because <laughs> it seemed so far-fetched at the time, but now that I've gotten older and I realize how much our mind can uh, create for us and how much it can hold us back, uh, just treasure that knowledge, yeah. How about you, Tim? I've had a lot of mentors in the industry and, and out of the in industry. I think the most formal mentorship and the most productive one has been with Joel Minchie, um, Minchie Music, and he's just uh, just a very, very wise, sharp person. And I think when you're, you know, there's there's informal mentorships, which is just relationship building and, and always asking questions and always looking for growth. And there's more formal mentorship um, opportunities and programs. And I think for that, really taking the time to choose the best fit for you or, you know, get involved in something that's going to really product, you know, be productful for you. But I think we would all agree that without some of those people in our lives, we would not in anywhere be where we are today, that we owe them a debt. Yeah. And I think that's part of what I think we wanted everyone here to think about is, A, to find someone like that or to be someone like that, yeah. to be that person. Can I add something to that quickly? People love being approached with answers. So if you, if you want somebody to be your mentor, just ask them. Most people will say, yes, I want to say. They'll be thrilled. They will be honored. I think, why are we hesitant, right? We're yes. afraid of rejection, I guess. You know? Yes. Um, given the fact that end zones have changed so many times for all of us, and I imagine many people here too, um, if you could go back and have a sit down with yourself 10 years ago, what would you say to yourself? Any words of advice, any kind of like helpful tips like, yeah, I wouldn't have done that one thing in Singapore. You know what I mean? Anything that you would have said to your younger self 10 years ago? Let's start with you, Laura. I mean, honestly, I think that everything has unfolded the way that it, it should, and it has, and I'm, and I'm comfortable with that. But um, yeah, just to believe in myself more, you know, believe that I can go further, believe that you can go further than you think that you can right now. Because once you start taking those processes, again, comes back to what I said before, the limiting beliefs. Once you start unlocking that and expand your, your mind, you, anything is possible. It really is. Yeah, the, the, the idea of monkey brain is what my wife calls it. When your head is just spinning about, oh, that won't work. This, give her the monkey brain and just realize it's all going to be okay. Worry a little less. Yeah. Absolutely. Still yeah, just worry. believe in yourself. Yeah. But worry a little just less. tell yourself that you believe in yourself. Yeah, give her the monkey brain. And you'll start brain. to believe yourself. <laughs> Tim. The younger Tim. Yes, I, th I would have. The gone. younger Tim would have probably been like getting his driver's license <laughs> gone now. You know? it's like, I just want to drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, uh, if I could go back, we started seven years ago. If I could go back seven years ago, I definitely would have. Um, one of the things that I've learned that I wish I knew then is that I, you can't be good at everything and, um, and know your strengths and know your weaknesses. And every weakness you have, if you are building a team to build a company or to get involved with the team, uh, lean on team members, whether they're, they are um, you know, uh, alongside you or not, but lean on them and use their strengths as your weaknesses and your weaknesses as their strengths. It kind of builds the whole, the whole waters. Rise. So, Paul, it's funny. Ten years ago, 
I it's easy. It. It's an anniversary. What would you have told that person 10 years ago? So at first I want to tell you what I was telling myself 10 years ago because it's probably very similar to what you're thinking right now, which is, oh my God, I'm going to die. What, it's, what am I going to do? It's the end of the world. But it's not the end of the world. It's only the beginning. So what I would tell myself right now and what I would tell all of you here today are two things. Believe in your ability to figure things out. There's a will, there's a way, and I want to tell you why I'm saying this. Because when I was offered my internship, I was asked if I could start in two weeks. I was living in San Diego, the position was in Scottsdale, I had about $6 in my checkings account, and I said yes, with conviction. I didn't know anybody in Scottsdale, never been to Arizona, but things worked out, like Laura was saying, better than I could have ever planned. So, number one, believe in your ability to figure things out. Number two, do not allow your current circumstances to dictate what your future is going to look like. That's what I would tell all of you. My situation was dire. And, um, and here I am just talking to all of you today. I'm so honored and grateful. Yes. Awesome, awesome, awesome bit of advice. And, and, and I think that is actually probably apropos for any age yes. at that point, right? Yes. Sarah. Yeah. Um, I'll give myself a better sense of time and uh, you know, personal journey, and my personal journey might take some time. And I say that because, <laughs> in a, uh, because you know, looking at the startup world um, and technology, you can look at someone else and say, okay, they built this in like five months and they're already a, a billion dollar company, <laughs> right? You know, over exaggerating, but really what your journey is, is your journey. And if you're pursuing the actions um, consistently to get where you need to go, then you're gonna get there, and that's your journey. So um, to everyone, you know, really just stick to your goals. Don't look to the left or the right. You get your own mentors, get your own network, and really just pursue your journey, and you'll make it. You know, I, I think we're just about out of time, but I think I'd sum this up in many ways as this industry does not look anything like it did 10 years ago. Very little resemblance to what I remember 10 years ago. It just, it changed. It did. It had to. Um, and here we are in 2020. We'll be sitting here in 2030, probably looking back on probably one of the most transformative decades in history. History, Because of a lot of the technology, a lot of other things that are on their way, it's going to accelerate everything we're going through. So the industry won't look anything like it does now. It just won't. And that's okay. I think that's really good. But I think this panel right here, to me, illustrates that we're going to be okay. It's all going to be okay because just, this is just a sampling of, of the people in our world. And every one of you have such unique and different skills and such unique and different things to give back and give to the world. And I just am more encouraged than ever about the future, knowing that it's going to be led by people like you. So 2030, we'll be sitting here again and just going, wow. That happened, <laughs> and I can't wait. So I wish you all the very best of luck in what you're doing, and I appreciate everything you've shared with our audience today. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the Thank opportunity. Guys. Wow, that was fast. <laughs> Not bad.